Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India When we were talking about society and the way it copes with uncertainty yesterday, we said there developed a practice in almost all human societies from the early days to cope with uncertainty by reducing it to an assumed certainty. In other words, people assumed that there is an all-encompassing force, there is an omniscient, omnipresent force or a being which is responsible for all that happens in human lives. No? You remember this? Right. We said this also while providing some kind of an insurance in the minds of people to cope with uncertainty, we said this also provided the source of attention in the minds of the people. The tension was with the other facet of the human being, the other facet of human societies, which is to learn from experience. All learning happens essentially through experience and interpretation of one's experience in terms of how others have interpreted the same experience which they had. This is the learning process. So, learning from experiences is a primordial thing just as having belief in an almighty force as being responsible for everything that happens in the universe. However, yes, however, the two forces cannot coincide, one force of the faith, another force of the learning process one force of pure belief and another force which is the opposite of it which is pure experience. So, this is the fundamental tension which has characterized all human societies at all times. Very often there is a breakdown of the way the systems of faith operate and the way is the way of the moral codes. Very often the moral codes become questionable in the light of human experience. And when human experience comes to question what is taken as a simple matter of faith, then one of the two has to give way. Knowledge from experience has to be corrected to accept that it is all a matter of faith. Or the faith itself undergoes a metamorphosis. This is the human condition through human history. We have seen this briefly yesterday. I am saying this now for the simple reason that this is how a lot of knowledge got constructed through human history, a process of a running tension between experience and faith. The construction of knowledge itself happens as people start with faith and then find an experience making them think slightly differently, making them see things slightly differently and over a period of time the faith itself comes under fire, under question. Then there is a tension, then there is a tension in the lives of people, in the lives of societies. 
because they are not able to hold on to the faiths, experience contradicts faiths. As a result, gradually faith gives ground, faith gives ground and experience and learning through experience gains ground. And it so happens that people are not all the time learning through experience. What happens is you learn something through experience that becomes the given datum for the way you look at life later. For example, if you walked up the stairs to the third floor of this building, your experience of the staircase would give you a particular information on how to get to the third floor. After some time before you enter the building, you subconsciously interact with the environment as if the staircase is already there, is not it? So, the staircase instead of being a fresh experience has now become a datum, an information on the basis of which you are acting. So, very often when you climb the stairs, you do not, you are not even aware of climbing the stairs it is almost a reflex, am I right? So, at this stage the staircase becomes a faith. Do I make sense? Shall I say this again? Now, tell me if you want me to say it again. I will say it many times over, because what I am saying is something very, very important. Yes? Okay. I will say it again. What we are now saying is that, while human societies begin with a series of faiths about almighty forces which govern the life to convert uncertainties into certainties. This faith does not rule all the time unilaterally or freely, because you are all the time running into experience which your senses are giving you. Your senses are all the time you know feeling the world around, your thought process is interpreting it empirically in the sense green is green, because there are neuro cells which identify green as green and not as red. Right? So, empirically you are interpreting experience. Now, what your experiences will tell you is bound to at some point or time of time or other run contrary to what the faith will tell you. The faith will tell you for instance that if I prayed for rains today, it will rain this evening and then I pray incessantly, it ends up to be a nice warm hot sunny day and it rains only day after tomorrow. So, then I ask myself, hey what is wrong with my prayer? And if I am a very stern austere person of faith, I will say there is something wrong in my faith. I should practice it even harder, even stronger. So, I hold on to the faith because it is rock solid. But comes a time when time and time again I pray time and time again it rains only the day after tomorrow. So, I say there is a time lag between the faith and its occurrence. Then after a while I find it is not day after tomorrow, it is random, the rain happens when it wants to happen. So, faith come to, comes under question, no? Hmm? Krishna? Right. So, when faith comes under question, human mind goes through a trauma, it goes through a shock, because it assumes that what is believed once, it is a fact, it is just, it is it, it, not bound to be questioned ever again by anything, but here it is experience questions faith. All right. Then what happens? Over a period of time something has to give, one of these two has to make adjustments. 
either your method of interpreting your experience undergoes through a change, it goes through a change or your method of believing goes through a change, but one of them has to change, right. Human thought is therefore, evolutionary. There is a fit between faith and experience. When the fit does not happen, there is a mismatch and one of them has to change, how you read experiences or how you have faith. This is the history of all thought, all knowledge, all societies. But that is what we have seen up to yesterday. What I am taking you up today is one step further to show that the faith is not a one time thing. All experiences give you inferences or information data, which in turn become faiths themselves. I was giving you the example of coming up three flights of stairs to the studio from down below on the ground floor. I said, when you are first given the instructions about how to get here, it is given through the experience of other people who have got here and you internalize what they have said and then you follow the directions as you have been asked to follow and then you get to the third floor and the studio. You do that once, the second time around you are able to manage more easily, you do not keep looking for landmarks all the time. By the time it is half a dozen times, you know how to get here so easily that you are not even looking at things when you are going up the stairs. You are not even aware of going up the stairs, you are making conversation with your pals who are walking up with you. You are just going up the stairs as a reflex, is not it? So, what was the first experiential inference for you about the staircase by now has become a faith. You know it is there, you know it is there and you do not question it. You know it is there, as a reflex you, you get to a particular place, as a reflex you start climbing. So, all information, all data themselves become sources of faith. Am I right? You want to think about it a bit? What I am trying to tell you is that there is no clear dividing line between what is experiential and what is a matter of faith. Something comes out of experience and then after a while that becomes a faith, you do not need to experience it again, it just is part of the backdrop of information which you simply believe to be true, no? Yes or no? Good. Now, therefore, here is a paradox. All knowledge which comes out of experience or everything that is empirical stops being empirical after a while, it just becomes another faith. Till another experience comes up and says, hey, there is something wrong with this faith. Then there is a questioning, there is an investigation, right? Eventually, the faith based on a prior information is now question and will possibly have to change, is not it? Then a new basis of thinking and functioning happens, which is based on verified contemporary information, contemporary data. It goes on for a while and eventually that too leads to more faiths. So, this process of construction of knowledge in society is a continuous oscillation between belief and quote unquote reality. I am saying quote unquote because a belief at one time was a reality at an earlier time. Make sense? So, this is a continuous oscillation in the process of construction of knowledge in society. I brought this huge argument 
so laboriously up because this is what happened to the way knowledge was constructed in human history. This is what happened in the place about which I am going to talk to you now, the place where knowledge got started getting constructed in Europe, namely ancient Greece. give you a few seconds to think it over and ask me if you have any questions to ask or any points to make. No? Can I carry on? Okay. Here I am going to introduce a name. I would not distract you from what you have on display in the monitors, because that we will need. There was a man called, a very brilliant sociological mind called Victor Turner. Turner is spelled T U R N E R, American social anthropologist. He was looking at this process. He said, a lot of things in human existence are rituals. You believe in it and you do it, it is not necessarily knowledge. So, he found that human civilizations, human cultures abounded in rituals. So, he wrote a lovely book called The Ritual Process. So, if you get hold of it, read it. Victor Turner, The Ritual Process. The reason I am mentioning Victor Turner here is, there is an aptness of Turner in this context. Turner looked at the society as being structured on the basis of some assumptions. There is a given social structure, which creates its own normative rules, which rules in turn became rules of conduct, rules of behavior, rules of interaction, the way the society flows. Oftentimes, human experience tells you that there is something wrong with a particular rule of conduct in the social structure, just as we discuss now. So, there is a running tension according to Turner between two facets of human, human mind, two facets of the social mind of the society of a group of people. He calls them structure and communitas. Now, structure is the way the mind works in the structured pattern in which you are used to in the society. The way the society itself works in patterns which are structured through time, through the social mores, through the social norms which you follow. Oftentimes, there is another side to you, not oftentimes, there is always another side to you which is experience based. And oftentimes, you act, you are compelled, you are pushed to act in contradiction to the structured ways of acting. It is it's the case, if you look back into your own life, look, look back into your own personality, if you look back into yourself, you will find that there has always been something structured in you. And there was always something that responded and reacted to experience. Now, this which responds to experience is what Turner called communitas. So, you have structure, you have communitas. Forces which work in opposite directions. Which, are, which lead to opposite types of actions and thoughts and most important, which are contradictory to each other. The whole process of history, human history is looked at by Turner as a continuous tension between structure and communitas. There are institutions, there are structures in human society which are very useful, which are very functionally significant, but which after a while become oppressive. 
they become oppressive simply because, because simply because they are so repetitive, because they are so what should I say hide bound in time and which make you unable to understand experience and ingest experience and make that experience guide your life. So, there is a running tension between structure and communitas. Yes? Plenty. Plenty. Maybe we can discuss this. We can we can take any examples in any ordinary life where I will give you one uh, commonest example is from the media. I do not know if that happens in this these days, but when I was growing up, when I was in college, when I was after college, the standard theme in many Hindi movies used to be a rich zamindar's daughter falling in love with a maybe a mendicant or a worker or whatever. Uh, some fellow who looked like some kind of a bodybuilder plus uh, you know macho all sorts of things, but he did not have the wherewithal to marry her because he came from a lower social background. So, here is an open conflict between structure and the kind of modes of behavior which it advocated and communitas which just comes from experience. I mean uh, you know uh, there is uh, probably the best lines. Uh, which describe you know falling in love at once are uh, again in uh, the Ramayana written by Kamban in Tamil. So, it is says it Kamban would like to believe that you know much more than an arranged marriage or the bow which he breaks and all that stuff. He, he likes to believe that actually Sita and Rama fell in love at sight and gives him great excitement. So, he walks down the street with Lakshmana and uh, Vishwamitra who is going with him to the Darbar and uh, she is looking out of her balcony looking at all the things that are happening there and, and he happens to look up at the same time and there is a flash. Kampan says Annalum no kinan, Avalum no kinan. and that was it. She looked and he looked that communicated the falling in love. Now, what I am trying to say is if that were the sole basis of Ramayana, then the whole story would have been totally different. No, there would have been no need to break any bows for one thing, right. Rama sees Sita, Sita sees Rama and says, oh boy, this is it, let us run. They elope, they do not need to go through the business of breaking and then all those other things which Rama and Sita had to do, go through horrible separations, this, that and so forth, some fellow carries her off and the whole of Ramayana probably would have been totally different if at that point they had followed the force of communitas. Am I right? She looks and he looks that is an experience which goes outside of structure. They look at each other and then uh, something happens they get emotionally very involved with each other without knowing anything about each other, but that moment of falling in love is communitas. Would you agree with that? Hmm? So, you have the best example of structure and communitas in Ramayana itself. Eventually, he goes through the structural process or structured process of winning her, but what the poet has said is well, it is already been approved by the two hearts. So, communitas has approved this and the structured conduct has followed this rule, so everybody is happy. Samastha loka sukino bhantu everybody is happy. But suppose they had not followed this rule, suppose communitas has happened and this man just looks up at the balcony and finds this girl who is looking at him and he's lost his heart. He does not know she is Sita. So, he tells the Rishi, hey hang on man, let me take a look at this woman and uh, do not rush me so. So, the Rishi says, no, 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 that is not good manners. No, no, look I am not concerned with manners, I want to see her. I mean we can be concerned about manners later. So, I've got Rishi says no that is not proper, but look I mean she is there and that is got nothing to do with propriety. So, what would happen to Ramayana at that time? Totally different no. Fortunately the structured theme of the story which is she was the princess of uh, uh, that place and Mithila and so forth and everything is fine. But as you can see, 
innately every moment of community as, as a threat, holds a threat for every structure. Am I not right? So, if we are so how how does knowledge get constructed in this process? As there is a structure and a community as this thing this conflict exists subterraneanly in the levels of in, diff, in the deep levels of social consciousness, eventually structure has to give. It is bombarded by more and more experience, more and more of communitas. So, at some point the structure gives, it goes through an adaptive change. So, social institutions are continuously adapting themselves, so that they can fit better with experience. Is not that what is happening? So, experience is the final desideratum, experience is the final guideline to whether any, any knowledge through faith is acceptable to you or not, eventually that is what happened. So, knowledge is a series of adaptation of, of structured information to experience, am I not right? Would you agree with me? Do you think it happens differently? No, all right then. This is the way all science happens. This is the way all research happens. This is the way all modern knowledge, all older knowledge, all traditional knowledge. This is the way. Excuse me. This is the way all knowledge has all the time happened in human history. In the Greek society too. About the time a lot of western knowledge is blooming, blossoming. We are talking about something between the 7th century BC to maybe the 4th century BC. Lots and lots of things are happening at that time in Greece. There too, these two forces are prevalent in the society. You have for instance, a whole series of faiths which govern the lives of people. There are mythologies leading to belief in particular structures of society, which lead to belief in specific ritual processes, which occupy the minds of the people and the whole of life is seen as a continuous process of purifying yourself, so that you would be better blessed by the divine forces. There is one big belief system happening out there, like all parts of human history, Greeks too had that. Then there was the other trait among the Greeks, which was the speculative, the inquiring side. And there was a big tension between this side of Greek society and the other side of Greek society. One of the finest exponents of communitas course, they did not know about these things at that time, Turner was not born, wasn't born then, but the finest exponent or finest representative of the force of communitas in Greece was Socrates. Are you familiar with Socrates? Why are you familiar with Socrates? Very nice. The Socratic, method. The Socratic method. Oh boy, your leagues ahead of me. Tell me what is the Socratic method? Uh, it's, it's a method where the teacher questions the student and goes into the Absolutely, absolutely. So you did you study this earlier? Yes. How nice. It's convenient. Very nice. So so you are familiar for with the the word Socratic method. So, why was Socrates getting into trouble all the time? Did you know he was getting into trouble all the time with the state, with the government, with the society around? Who said yes? Yes, all right, Aditi. Aditi, no? All right, tell me, why did he get into trouble? Yes. 
In other words, he was telling people to ask questions, not, not to accept anything on the face value, not to accept anything ipso facto as it were, just because you are told that this is so, no. He said, ask questions. So, why is it, why does it take you into trouble if you keep asking questions and keep asking other people to ask questions? So, what was wrong with the Socratic method? Why that it so irritated people? Order. Mm. The word order has come up twice, right? Both of you searched for it and found the word order. Am I not right? Aditi said what about order? Your Aditi, no? Yes. No. Yes, because there was an existing belief system or a certain order in society. And uh, what Socrates did was to question. Yeah, he questioned it. I mean, he looked outside of the order. Yeah. Beautiful. And you said the same. Something wrong with it? They felt basically they, they felt insecure. They felt attacked. They felt threatened. No? Right? So, what he was doing was making people ask questions, and this was perceived as a threat by anybody who was upholding the order of the day. Am I right? And therefore, he was charged of being seditious. What is sedition? Going against the existing order. And the existing order tells you whether you will be punished or not for it. The existing order perceives you as an asker of questions to be a threat because you are asking questions about something which I have taken for granted. Now, you are asking questions. When you ask questions, I become uncertain, is not it? When I become uncertain, I am back with the old problem, which led me to the faith, is not it? So, there is a ruthlessness now at this point, with which I have to defend that faith. Ruthlessness, because I cannot argue with you about faith. Faith is only faith, it is. And if it goes, there is a void, there is terrible uncertainty, there is disorder, is not it? So, the, the challenge of disorder was the challenge of incredible uncertainty in existence. So, order and certainty are one and the same and order ensures certainty because it is an unquestioned faith. Am I right? So, this is the root of all conservatism, the structure is the root of all conservatism in a society. Communitas is the root of all that is radical in a society. Put it at a micro level, the root of all that is order in you is the way you are structured through your life, conditioned in particular ways of thinking, functioning, acting. And you start questioning what is structured in you, you become seditious to that very order. So, depending upon how strong that threat is, you might either get angry or you might simply go insane. No? 
So, this is what happened to Greek society when a man like the society in Athens, when a man like Socrates kept on telling people, no, 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 ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, right. So, you had the tradition from which Socrates came, which is a tradition of the thinking, speculative, experience oriented human beings as opposed to the tradition of simply believing, right. So, the core of the construction of the knowledge which you know from the west as western knowledge today was constructed through this process and Socrates was a couple of generations earlier than the people who actually became the constructors of modern western knowledge. I am talking about a person called Aristotle. Aristotle's teacher was Plato and Plato's, Plato's teacher was Socrates and Socrates himself learnt a lot from another man who did not see anything as radical as Socrates was saying, but who gave the underlying beliefs and faiths to a lot of faiths and beliefs of Socrates himself and that man was Pythagoras. So, you have this big line of thinkers, each learning from the other, each passing on knowledge for about 2, 300 years in Greece at that time. And at the end of this process, knowledge adapts itself. After 2, 300 years of questioning, 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 the process of construction of knowledge becomes liberated completely from all but one faith. all but one faith and that and that one faith is there is substantially something about this world around us which is eternal which is immutable which is there but which cannot be verified now that constituted the backdrop of the refinement of knowledge which came into Plato and then subsequently was expressed so significantly by Aristotle. But where did it start with? It started with a much earlier system where you had belief in various gods and so on and so forth and the transition occurs from believing in not just one God, but a whole pantheon of gods who would explain the universe to you in terms of certain faiths. But from there questioning, questioning, debates and more questioning for a couple of hundred years, it finally boils down to the kind of substance which Aristotle comes up with subsequently. In many respects, I cannot go into the details of this, perhaps you have studied this earlier. A large part of what goes into the designation of western systems of knowledge today, including Newton, including all that thought process which came after Newton, a lot of this is attributed to a process of thought which is called Aristotelian. Do you have any questions at this point? Because it looks to me that I am the only one who is talking, <laughs> which is true, but I wish somebody else spoke too. Can you look for illustrations in your neighborhood? Uh, what I mean is in your own life's experience to this stress, this stress, this tension which you see between structure and communitas. Can you look around? Excuse me, you are the second Sharanya. Uh, yes. Sorry, I should be calling you, you are the only Sharanya. Right. Um, the whole uh, thing about section 377, um, initially it was uh, a criminal offense, homosexuality was a criminal offense in India, but uh, nobody had ever been prosecuted under that because uh, the Indian system is such that 
it's sort of considered to be within the private, uh, the realm of people's private affairs. Now that it's been decriminalized, a lot of people are fighting for it to be uh, legalized, for uh, gay marriage to be legalized. But that would sort of disrupt the social order mm -hmm. and the structure of families. So, uh, could that be seen as an example? Excellent, of excellent. And what about the big debate which goes on in the US for the last 25 years on the right to abort a baby? It's still a debate. Isn't it? Fundamentally, it's I mean the the religious right in the U.S. looks upon it as a violation of a divine relationship between one life and another life which it bears, and it is considered sacrilegious to even think in terms of interfering in this relationship. Now, uh, the pro-abortionists are simply as Socrates did, they are asking questions. Okay, it is divine, so what happens if I break it? So, if for some reason, uh, there could be any number of reasons, if for some reason I were to find that I have conceived a baby and this baby is going to lead to all kinds of trouble in my life, disrupt my existence completely, I would my, my career would be lost, my future would be lost, then what is the point of looking, what is the point of my uh, simply stating that I have no right to tamper with something which interferes with my future, with my life and so forth. So, is it not my decision whether I should allow this uh, fetus to grow in my body or not? That is the other side. Now, as you can see, the side from the structure looks upon it as uh, fundamentally seditious, because they say it is sacrilegious, it violates the most fundamental aspect of religion. So, that is one example, is not it? Can you think of something in the political realm in your neighborhood in India? Beautiful, lovely. So, what does that mean? Surely, yes. But uh, essentially, that uh, we have a right to know uh, why certain, mm -hmm. for instance, how uh, certain public funds are being spent mm -hmm. uh, that we've contributed to the tax. How government institutions work. Why is it considered a sedition to ask for information? Of course, it's no longer sedition because it's an act. But still, it is perceived as a threat, is not it? Why? I see that. So, what you are suggesting is, it curtails the discretion or discretionary behavior of the government officials by pushing them in to become accountable at every stage. And then they say, the structure cannot work like that. If I have to stop at every nook and corner and explain myself to people, then the whole structure would collapse. The bureaucracy would not work. That is the argument from the side of the bureaucracy. So, once again you find a running tension here between structure and communitas. I know, I know, I know. Governments have the right to sort of keep, the state has the right to keep certain information. And this man went about letting everybody know what it is all about. Right. So, you can see the world has not changed very much from the time of Socrates, is not it? It is still seditious to question order. It is still seditious to question order. It is a source of disorder every time a question is raised, right. This is the hard path which modern science had to take from the time of the Greeks, because what science does is to ask questions. And I can see that asking questions, no matter what you are asking questions about, 
is fundamentally seditious because you are questioning some aspect of some order. So, you ask questions, you are provoking disorder, right. This is the crisis which the Greeks went through. We will talk about it in about 10 minutes time after the break. And the issue there is, it all developed in Greece in a manner in which it answered many questions for centuries to come across. After the Greeks, after the grand expose of knowledge and questioning by the great Greek thinkers, western world went through a huge paralysis. It went into a hyper faith and it built incredible structures around this hyper faith, structures for which thousands of people were killed in order to protect that structure. The birth of the church. So, for a long period after the Greeks, in fact, for nearly about 1000 400, 500 years, the western world was intellectually paralyzed, because the forces of faith had won such incredible crushing victory over the forces of questioning, that questioning was met with death, crucifixion, but better still, you were just burnt to death at stakes. So, this goes on, it reaches its acme around as I told you between 1200, 1300, 1400 that period, this repressive behavior and finally, that too has to be held to account, it breaks down. One of the reasons why it breaks down is because the church has lost its bona fide in the human society. The church has lost its credibility, so that by the 16th century you find the church breaking up. New forms of faith in Christ, new forms of faith in the life of Christ and the mission of Christ come up, which question the very need for an existence of a church, which question the need for all the knowledge which the church has said as certain theology. This new breed of Christians say, all this is hogwash, it makes no sense, we do not need it. The relationship between man and Jesus, man and God is one on one. So, this new form of Christianity, because it protests so much, comes to be called Protestant. So, the breakdown of the church in the face of the Protestant threat, threat is one of the basic reasons underlying which, I mean underlying the rise of modern science rise of modern forms of knowledge, technology and so forth. So, all this in the next class and the class after that. Do you have any questions at this point? You will have your coffee of course, I have organized that. Do you realize then when we do a thing called syllabus? That is a structure, an oppressive structure, is not it? But can you have knowledge organized, communicated without a syllabus? Right. So, all the time in my teaching career of all these years, there has been this problem of being a party to the making of a syllabus and reacting to the very syllabus I helped create pretty violently afterwards, till such a time that I got out of all the syllabus making committees. But I only saved my skin in so doing, because I only saved myself from the crisis, inner crisis. So, eventually in the last 5, 6 years of my teaching in the University of Madras, the structure adapted. The structure adapted so magnificently, so thoroughly, so overwhelmingly that I, I had no more questions to ask about the syllabus. What happened was, 
they changed the whole thing thoroughly. They made the individual teacher offering a course entirely responsible as your IIT for the designing of the course, for the decision as to how the students are going to be evaluated and eventually finally conducting the evaluation of the students too. So, the university in one step broke away from all the structures which it had inherited through time. After that, what happened was some people created little structures which made them feel convenient, comfortable, etcetera. They carried on, but people like me, I took advantage of this to tell the students mid course, which you can do here, I guess, but you could do that in Madras University at that time. I could tell them I have read a very interesting article which is fantastic and you need to study it now. So, let us sort of in place of this x, I am removing that from the syllabus, I am bringing in this z, let us study z and the students say okay. So, the only reason they could object is that they were not informed in advance. So, every change I made if I informed them in advance, that was fine. So, what happened was we had what is called a flexible syllabus, seemingly a contradiction in terms, but it happened in the universities. Well, this is an illustration of structure communitas as I experienced it. All right, let us go for copies.